There is an exciting Sony camera that's rumored to come out in the spring of 2024, and it's the Mark II version of the highly populated and geared toward the content creator Sony ZV-E10 that we're assuming is going to be called the Sony ZV-E10 Mark II. It could be outstanding. It also could be a huge ball drop if they don't get one thing right. First off, let's discuss what features I think it's gonna have to set the stage. The original ZV-E10 was really strong in a lot of ways and I've covered it heavily on this channel. And where it was lacking is where I think the Mark II version of the E10 is gonna aim to fill some of those voids but it could be at a cost that I don't see a lot of people talking about. Four main weaknesses about the E10. The first one is that the autofocus was acceptable, but it really wasn't great. It only had an 84% screen coverage for autofocus points. Sony still leads the class and the E10 was overall quite strong, but these newer Sony cameras are crushing when it comes to autofocus. It only had 8-bit color, which once you get access to 10-bit, it's really hard to go back to 8-bit. 10-bit just tends to look a lot more natural and you can push the colors a lot further. It also had no 4K slow motion options and no in-camera stabilization, which again, I think these are the things that the E10 Mark II is gonna try to fill. So you have the Sony ZV E10 Mark II, and I think what you're really gonna see is you're gonna see a hybrid, a blend between the A6700 and the ZV E1, which are both cameras that were released in 2023. With the E10 coming out in 2024, you're gonna get a lot of that technology kind of squished in to the E10, but they're gonna have to save some cost and make sure that they separate the market and the offering here a little bit. So what things is the ZV E10 Mark II gonna inherit from the A6700? The most obvious thing is gonna be the sensor. They're both crop sensor cameras. Sony has produced an outstanding crop sensor with the FX30 that the A6700 took. And you have to think that the E10 is gonna have that as well. What's that gonna do in terms of features? First thing, I expect us to see 10-bit color out of the E10 Mark II, which is gonna be great. Additionally, I think we'll see 4K 60. Might have a crop, but I think we're gonna see 4K slow motion. I think we're also gonna get some kind of dual ISO, which is gonna be really helpful in low light situations. You're seeing Sony do this on almost all of their recent cameras, including the A6700. So with that sensor, I think they're gonna include that in the E10 Mark II. We'll likely get S Cinetone. This is Sony's desirable picture profile. It's really good on the skin tones and just really good for a quick turnaround with not a lot of color grading in post, given that the E10 Mark II is likely gonna be geared toward the content creator and kind of beginner user. I think you're gonna definitely see S Cinetone in that camera. And I think we'll likely get 26 megapixels for still photography, which I think is the sweet spot. And I think you're also gonna see a really good intelligent auto in the E10 Mark II, again, leaning toward that beginner to intermediate content creator. Next is gonna be the AI chip. Sony's been producing these at a lower cost, starting out with the E1, which we'll talk about in a second. You also saw it in the A6700, and that really does two pretty monumental things for the E10 Mark II. First thing that does is a wildly improved autofocus. Sony's already outstanding with autofocus, but with this AI chip, it's just, they're just showing off at this point. It's incredibly sticky. I've been using this AI-based autofocus on the ZV-E1, the A6700, and the A7C Mark II, and have ridiculous amount of confidence that the autofocus is gonna take care of me as a solo creator. And I think we'll definitely see the auto framing feature coming from that AI chip. And this is when the camera is gonna crop in on a subject and it's gonna track them around the frame as if somebody else was filming them. With where the E10 Mark II is likely gonna be targeted towards, I, I think you're absolutely gonna be seeing this auto framing feature. A few more things that we might inherit from the A6700. I'm just calling this like the operating system. I don't know if there's a better term for it, but that's what I'm gonna call it. What you're gonna get with that, you're gonna get the updated menu. The, the original E10 had the older Sony menu, which is not anybody's favorite, but they introduced in the A7S III a while ago. You're starting to see that, or you're definitely seeing that in all the newer cameras, and the updated menu is just a lot better. You're gonna see that in the E10 Mark II. I think we'll also see the ability to install user LUTs onto the camera. This is something that really is only effective for S-Log. That's one downside to it. But I do think that because you're seeing in all the newer cameras, the E10 Mark II is most likely gonna have the ability to install user LUTs. And I definitely think we'll see the cinematic vlog mode, which really just drops two bars 
bars over top of the frame, but if you don't know how to do that in post and you want faster turnarounds, that can be a helpful feature. And I think we'll also see creative profiles. Sony's doing the different looks that are baked into the footage. Some are cooler, some are warmer, some are more cinematic, some are black and white. And what that's gonna do is along with the cinematic vlog and potentially a cinetone and these creative profiles, it's just gonna give newer creators the ability to put all that together and get a cinematic look a lot faster without worrying much in post. But what is the ZV-E10 Mark II gonna get from the ZV-E1? I think the biggest thing it's gonna take is gonna be the camera body. It's not, my, it's not necessarily a good thing. I don't love the camera body on the E1. It's not super robust, but it does allow the cost to be cut down while packing a lot of the tech features in. It's gonna get a similar button layout, which there's not enough customizable buttons on the E1, but you do get a touch screen. And I think the E10 Mark II is gonna get that too, meaning that old Sony cameras had touch screens too for like touch focus or touch tracking. But I think what you'll get here is the ability to change things like your ISO or your aperture, your shutter speed, your white balance, from the screen, which is particularly useful when you're in vlog mode. You don't wanna guess what buttons you're pushing, like manual buttons in the back of the camera. You can just look at them on the touchscreen. I do think it'll get the microphone, which is a good thing. Uh, that microphone's strong enough for a on-camera microphone, but it does have some AI features too, where you put it in auto mode and it'll auto detect if the sound or the voice is coming from in front of the camera or behind the camera or all around the camera. So that can be a nice feature. Again, kind of leaning toward that quicker turnaround, less editing in post. Hopefully, I'm not sure on this one, not sure on any of this, but I'm really hoping that it gets the Z battery. If it inherits the ZV-E1 camera body, that camera body does have the Z battery. This actually gets into my, my one thing they better get right, but the ZV-E1 has the Z battery with that camera body. I think the E10, if it takes the same camera body, which I really think it will just with the crop sensor, I think we're gonna see the Z battery, which is a, a huge positive, it's a fantastic battery with plenty of record and shot time on that one. In-camera stabilization, it's gonna get something. It didn't have anything previously. I think it's gonna get something. I just put this one here because it made sense with the camera body, maybe it made sense with the sensor. Anyways, I think it's gonna be something similar to the A6700, which has in-camera stabilization. It's not as good as the E1. The E1 has what's called dynamic active stabilization, which is as close as you're gonna get is using a camera on a gimbal. It's very stable, very smooth, but it uses a full frame sensor and crops in a little bit to do that. With the E10, it's a crop sensor camera. I'm not sure if they have the space on the sensor to utilize the dynamic active and crop in and get that. If they can do it, that's gonna be fantastic. We'll get something. Uh, I'm not sure it's gonna be the dynamic active, but it'll be better than the Mark I, that's for sure. But the big question you're probably asking is how much is this thing gonna cost? I think it's gonna come in at 898 for the camera body only. You can get the E10 original right now for 698 for the camera body only. I think the E10 Mark II having some upgrades, you're gonna see the price bump a little bit there, which makes sense, but it's gonna be sub 1000, I think. And because of who they're gearing this toward, really aiming toward that entry level, I think they're gonna have to keep it under $1,000 to get people to actually buy it. And then I think the price goes up 100 bucks to 998 if you wanna get the camera that includes Sony's 16 to 50, 3.5 to 5.6 crop sensor kit lens that they've been including on their crop sensor cameras. Current price point for the E10, non Mark II, the E10 698, when you put that same lens on, it goes to 798. So I think if that 898 is correct, I think it'll be a $100 bump and still keeping it sub 1000, although they're getting close. So back here on this idea of the E10 Mark II being a blend between the A6700 and the ZV-E1, from a cost perspective, the A6700 camera body only is 1269 and the ZV-E1 is 2199. A hard time seeing the E10 Mark II being more expensive than the A6700, like we just talked about. But that does mean that they're not gonna just produce a same exact camera as the A6700 in the ZV-E1 camera body. There's gonna have to be some trade-offs and cut some costs to separate these offerings, even though Sony's getting pretty pretty overlapped with what they're doing here. So what does that cutting the cost and separating the offerings likely mean for the E10 Mark II? The first thing, I don't think we're gonna see 4K 120 in this camera. The A6700 has that. I don't think they can offer that at a lower price point than the A6700 because then they're gonna completely cannibalize that A6700 camera. They've done that in the past, but I don't think they're gonna include 4K 120. 
Back on the camera body thing, similar to the ZV-E1, I think they're gonna have to cut some corners when it comes to weather sealing. I think you're gonna, A6700 is fantastically weathered sealed, and I think the E10 Mark II is not gonna have nearly the level of weather sealing that we're seeing in the A6700, and they're not gonna be able to include the dynamic stabilization like they do in the E1. Not that this camera is gonna be getting toward that $2,000 price point of the E1, but it's gonna be like its little brother. So you're gonna to start to see some of the cost cuts happening there. That's my guess, there could be more on that note. But here's the thing that they absolutely can't get wrong. I think if they get this wrong, they're gonna really hurt the camera. The A6700 and the ZV-E1 both overheat in let's say about an hour. When you're live streaming, it's a little bit less, different codecs and conditions make a difference. But the E10 original, the original E10, you could film with like 10 days straight with that camera, it's not gonna overheat. You might run out of space or your battery might die, but it doesn't overheat. So I think when you're starting to include 10-bit color, different codecs, the Z battery stuffed into the E1 camera body with almost no heat sink, I get a little bit concerned about potential overheating with this camera. They get that wrong. I fear that content creators and just entry level people are not gonna go toward that camera because likely they're needing to film for a while or using it as a live streaming camera. And it could be a huge cripple hammer if they don't get this right. And although these are all rumors and I like our odds of what we've talked about, I haven't used this camera. Sony has yet to show this channel some love but you can show it some love by giving it a tap on the thumbs up. And maybe with enough of those, we can get Sony's attention, see if we can't get this camera early so that I can get videos and tutorials out about it for all of you ASAP. But until then, if you wanna know literally everything about the original Sony ZV-E10, you can check out this video. Admittedly, long video, but again, it's literally everything you need to know about it. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. See ya.